Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Our guest today is Major Bruce Goodmanson. He's an author of several books and an expert in tactical history. And if that sort of thing is of particular interest to you, do yourself a favor and check out his entire list of work where he gets granular on the strengths, challenges, vulnerabilities, and evolution of the tactics and tools of the great conquering forces in history. Even better, on today's show, he'll discuss his approach as an historian and a case teacher for imparting the techniques, attitudes, planning methods, and specific skills that empower those who teach Marine instructors and leaders to bring out the best in their students and those in their command. He's a fascinating thinker. Here's our guest, Bruce Goodmanson. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hello, uh, this is Bruce Goodmanson from beautiful downtown Quantico, Virginia, the host of Radio PME, and I'm here on the Break It Down show... And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is awesome. I love it. We have all these strategy shows all the time, and it's just, you know, being able to grab all of these different strategy, I don't want to call them silos, Bruce, but you get what I'm saying with this, where yeah. you have disciplines, and we all have our things that we hold precious. So everybody's Everybody's got a ring, you know, whether it's tankers with their tanks or you know, artillery people with their artillery pieces. But the reality is, is that we all know that when we get there to that fight, wherever that fight is, uh, we're going to have to figure it out and, and absorb a lot of what I call miscomfort. You know, it's a comfort that you're just not comfortable with yet. You'll get there, but it takes some time to get there. And so I, I think we all sort of work in this space where we're trying to decide what, what the, reduce that miscomfort time when they go to whatever fight it is that they get sent to and accounting for what the budget might allow, you know, and just all these different things that we have to try to pack into the, the front end, you know, the, the zero or competition phase world. So in terms of for the audience, just to understand Bruce, Bruce does a lot of things and covers a lot of ground. You can find him all over the web. You can find him on LinkedIn, uh, on on Twitter. Go to Case Method Club. He teaches using case methods. So he he basically puts he puts his students in a situation and they start working on how to get out of it. and And you start winnowing down options real fast, given the situation that you're in. But but he's look he's prolific. He works he works out on the East Coast at Quantico. Uh, you have your podcast, which I was listening to the episode with you and Don Vandergriff, who's been on the show before. So you do a lot of things for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Let's just let's just get started. Give me your basic philosophy on using cases as a means of teaching officers. Well, I get this philosophy from Marvin Gaye. Uh huh. Remember Marvin Gaye? Sure. Old, older uh, older listeners will remember Marvin Gaye, and he had a song called "What's Going On." He sure did. Which, it's strange to say, was actually about the Vietnam War and coming back from Vietnam and trying to figure out what's going on in the country. But that, that, that tagline in the song, what's going on, the title line, really is the fundamental question mm -hmm. that every military person has got to answer all the time. What's really going on here? If I want to get fancy, I can quote Ferdinand Foch in French. Oh, so Ferdinand Foch. He had the question, de quoi s'agit-il, which is French for what's going what's on. What's going on, yeah. What's going on. So what, what, what's really going on? Before the show, we, uh, we were chatting about the ground truth. Yes. It's the same, the same idea. There's, there, there's an external reality here, and the, every military person has got to figure that out and figure that out in real time. Yeah. John Boyd would call this observation and orientation. Okay. The right now the Marine Corps is struggling with with the idea of learning and trying to create a doctrine uh, a, that captures this this phenomenon, this, this essence of how do you learn from how do you learn from the environment? How do you learn from the enemy? It's not the idea that that um, someone's going to figure it out for you. Right. Well, you get, you, everybody has to figure this out for themselves. So the question is, how do we empower people to do this? Okay. 
Let, let me stop you right there and let's just start breaking this part of this process down because you know you talk about observing and orienting and that's the first two letters of the OODA loop. That's also a John Boyd thing. And, and we're not going to get all OODA loopy here. But one of the things that I, I challenge the Boyd folks with, and, and I totally dig what John Boyd does, and I'm not against any Boydian people, but culture is underaccounted for. It's just something that we do and like check it off the box. Check. Right. But from being on the ground and watching, we literally have zero ability to adapt to or channel culture to our our benefit and for sure not to our partner's benefit. So that affects and, you know, dramatically changes your ability to orient properly. And, and then one of the things you discuss in your stuff and we're diving into the deep end here is uh, the Socratic conversations, you know, where you orient towards something. And if there are multiple ori spherical orient orientation possibilities and you have a singular one, Pete would submit you're losing at this point. So I, and I know you, you have an idea on this and how we help officers get to a different observational point to go, wow, what I thought I knew about this situation is completely false and I've got to act differently in some way. Yes, no, culture, culture is very important and it's important on, on a couple of levels. First of all, our, we have to understand our own culture. Right. Which is a lens through which we, we see things. And the broader that lens or the more lenses we have, uh, the better we are able to see things. Imagine going to the eye doctor and, you know, that thing the eye doctor does with does this lens look better. Does this lens look better? That, that great big um, machine they put on your uh, on, on your eyes and they keep putting in the different glass lenses. Each one of those lenses is is culture. Right. It's your own culture. It's the culture of the people you're working with, the culture of your allies, the culture of the different arms you're working with. You know, artillery has a different culture from, from the infantry. Marines have a different culture from the army. Our, our, our coalition partners, our allies will have a different culture. Our enemies will have different cultures. Different units will have different cultures. So you've got all these, these, these lenses and you want to get the clearest picture possible. So the more... The more lenses you can put into that that thing on your nose, uh, the, the the better off the better off you are, and and I think this is why I'm such a big fan of, of a lot of the things I um, I'm pushing. But a big one is the case method, mm. which is the the use of what I call decision forcing cases. These are exercises that are based upon a real event. That's the key. That's the first key. Yeah. The second thing is they look at the real event from the point of view of a particular person, not an abstraction, but an actual person. It's not Napoleonic warfare. It is Napoleon. You are Napoleon the first emperor of the French. It is one January, 1814. Here's your situation. And then we ask, we ask Marvin Gaye's question. Yeah. What's going on? Or, if you want to be fancy, and since Napoleon spoke French, albeit with a, with a funny accent, the we say to quoi s'agit What's what's really going on here? And then we ask, what what are you going to do? Right. What's your plan? What what now, Lieutenant? To, to to borrow a title from a film, a training film from World War II. What do you do? What's okay. your plan? Let me let me jump in then. Let me give you the standard military officer answer. From Napoleon himself, audacity, 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 always audacity. Yeah. Just yes, right, right, right. And, and there is there, there is enormous value in that. Right. And a big part, the way this supports audacity by having these exercises where you're not thinking about what's the right answer or what's the school solution. Yeah. Instead, you're thinking about what do I do now? If you do that over and over and over again, you create a bias for action. That's a, a, a phrase coined by, by, Ru by the late Russell Stolfi. Yeah. And he wrote a book uh, some years ago about Rommel and the 7th Panzer Division. So in 1940, you know, Rommel was crossing the Meuse. And he looked through his radio traffic and talked about his bias for action. Well, the, the case method, the use of decision-forcing cases 
fosters that bias for action because you're always thinking, what next? What am I going to do? What's going on? What do I do? What's going on? What do I do? That's a dangerous path. I mean, you can, I, I think, you know, as someone who's a spy, if I understand that about someone's training, I'm going to find a way to exploit that. And uh, I'll give you an example of, of something that might look like that. I, I worked for a unit in Iraq, and they would go and they would beat the shit out of the side of this river trying to find anything that was buried in there. And they always found a weapons cache. And they would come back with two or three old rusty mortars, you know, maybe a bag full of guns. And uh, it was you know, declared as a, a big victory. Weapons cache cleared. And yes, absolutely you're clearing weapons caches and taking things off the field. What we never caught were the people putting the caches there. And we never, you know, and this is a, a through way, but it was exceptionally distracting for this unit. We spent a lot of time talking about very small wins. And it's like, yeah, this is perfect. I would love to, and I thought about this, like I would love to create that kind of a distraction for this massive military thing where like I would just purposely take things that are junk to me but look like valuable to the the American army and tie them up because there's a 70 year old mortar shell in the side of a river. And I would just pay kids to go take those things down there and dump them in and then just do everything else. Like a magician slide a hand right around the Americans as they sat obsessing about this 70 year old mortar shell. Well, and then, so there you, what you've got is a case. Right? Yeah. So you've got, you've got Pete Turner, you're in Iraq, you're in, there's a time and a place. So it's not right. just Iraq. It's a place in Iraq. It's a particular day. And your unit keeps finding this old gear. Yeah. These, this old equipment. And you're thinking, okay, what's going on? What's here? going on? Yeah. What, what's really going on here? Is somebody trying to play us? Is somebody trying to just keep us busy? Is this, are they setting us up for, for, for a big trap in the future? At right. one point, are, are they trying to, to set up this pattern whereby we get uh, we get in the habit of finding this gear, taking it back to our superiors? You take the photographs, send those up the chain of command. The chain of command is happy because they've got success. Right. But at some point, will this turn into an ambush, or are they simply trying to keep us busy while they do something else? Yeah. We, as a unit, we were not asking these questions out loud. <laughs> so, so, so why weren't you asking those questions? Well, you know, honestly, for me, that wasn't my job, right? My job was to sit back and report on a very specific thing. I was a, a, at least at best, a secondary, if not tertiary member of the staff where I was mostly there to shut up and say my words during my 30 seconds part of the brief. But it didn't change the reality of what I saw as a whole, as a whole unit, you know? So how, yeah. I mean, how do you, uh, because if I speak up, well, you know how this works. If I speak up in that, in that room and that's not how this unit played ball, then I'm not going to be in that room anymore. Likely on a plane going home because I'm a, I'm a problem or whatever, you know? So that, that's actually a, a very unhealthy yeah. <laughs> situation, right? Be, because if you've got a, a unit, where people aren't asking that question all the time. They're doing something other than engaging their environment. They're not engaging the enemy, if there is an enemy. Right. Because you may be dealing with, with a frenemy. Right. Right. Somebody who doesn't want to fight you. He's right. got his own agenda. And I think we're, we, you know, we've been in, involved in places where the real fight happens after we leave. Yeah. A lot of people are saying okay, the, the Americans are here. Americans eventually go home. Everybody knows this. Everybody, everybody knows our history. We're going to eventually going to go home. So, so how do I play this game to set myself up for the real war that happens after the Americans leave? I want to accumulate power. I want to accumulate prestige. So yeah, maybe if, 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 if I basically do a goodwill run for the Americans, every week or so I can keep them off my back. I can do what I want in terms of, of, uh, of recruiting, of amassing, you know, money, amassing followers. Uh, I can, I can you know, just 
I can clean out my warehouse right. to, make, to make sure that all my motor ammunition is good and fresh. All these things I can I, I can do so that when the real war happens, I'm I, I'm ready for it. Right. The other thing is I'm having a good laugh. Yeah. Right. I'm I'm really having a good time. So when I'm sitting around with my buddies, you know, drinking really really strong coffee, I'm, you know, I've got stories to tell. And these are great stories. So you, you know, the, the, these guys, you've tweaked the nose of the eagle or the beak of the eagle, I guess. So you tweak, you know, the the um, this elephant has come through your neighborhood, right. and you made the elephant dance. <laughs> right? How how cool is that? It's pretty damn cool. Yeah. So again, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but it's certainly a possibility. But I, but what, what I do know is is when Americans go into harm's way. We want them to be able to figure things out like this. Mm -hmm. And the start of that is asking the question of what's really going on. Right. So this is very much the opposite of the what I call the doctrinaire idea of, of employment. So speaking of speaking of, of, of elephants, my friend Bill Lind, you've heard of uh, Bill sure. Lind, William S. Lind, who wrote yeah. War for Handbook and, and uh he, he's compared the the U.S. Army to, uh, and of course, it's not just the U.S. Army that thinks this way. There's a lot of pe people, unfortunately, in the Marine Corps think this way, to an opera company. And this opera company does Aida, right? It's the, okay. the, the opera of the Egyptian princess. And it's a beautiful, it's a gorgeous Aida. They've, they've, they've got the chorus, you know, with, with spears down. They've, they've even they've got paper mache pyramids. They've got the people who can sing the princess and the other, other they, they, they've got it down. They even have elephants. Right? This is a really, really first class, world class production of Aida. The trouble is, warfare is evening at the improv. Yeah. It does, you know, it, 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 now maybe you get Aida. You know, Desert Storm was very bad for our culture because it was pretty close to Aida. It wasn't completely, but it, it was, you know, 90% Aida. Right. So we ended up thinking, hey, uh, this, 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 this is real war. But most of the things we've been involved with before and since, starting ironically with our own War of Independence, which we ought to study more, yeah. I believe, very strongly, has been something other than Aida. It's, it, it's had that evening at the improv quality. So why are we telling people there is this, there is, there is this thing called conventional warfare that we want to do? Yes. That every everything else that we don't do is somehow an imperfect thing. It's somehow it's somehow a lesser included offense. It's somehow something that we don't really want to do. It's not real war. Well, if people are are firing at you, if things are blowing up, that's real war. The fact that it doesn't fit some template doesn't match the manual doesn't make it any less less real so the question then is how do you prepare people for this ever-changing reality how do you prepare people to, to, to be like i use the, the the analogy of the improvisational comedian or the improvisational comedy troupe they do in fact practice things they practice lots of things they have they have routines but the way in which they do it is unique every, every every night every every show is unique and that's the philosophy at at the heart of what i'm trying to do here in in military education yeah it's interesting you have a thing called the military instructor gateway and everybody can learn a lot more about bruce's work at teach.blogspot.mil um, or just get on to twitter and you could go to Case Method Club, and you could start talking about these things. And, and this is this is fascinating because we're all nodding our heads, yes, yes, yes. But the reality is, right? Like, and I, I say this a lot, Bruce. That you know, modern combat, at least five, I think probably six elements now that I've figured out. One, obviously, militarily, got to have some dominance in there if it, if it offers itself. But socially, politically, culturally, religion, and information are all different areas that you have to have some mastery of or at least account for if you're going to be successful so the institution trade and all these and i'm not trying to point fingers i'm just saying 
these monoliths that we've built, they don't like to accept that. Like you said, we want this to be a tank on tank fight. We're waiting for the Russians to amass and, and go after him because this is the fight that we're desperate to have. The other fights are just impossible for us to deal with. And, and maybe we're the best in the world, Adam, because there's so much of us. But, you know, we lose the information fight, the, the what I call the affect over effect fight all the time. You know, where, where we do action X, do a, uh, you know, a battle damage assessment, you know, and, and we like, we killed the number one person in ISIS. And then two seconds later, the number one person in ISIS is somebody else, you know, and then we don't own the message on the ground as to what just happened. And I would see this all the time in my work. I would go out and find out what's going on. And it was often dramatically different than what I would see projected on the wall on a PowerPoint. Oh, very, very much so. Now, the, the I, I I think a lot of what we do is what the French call professional deformation. And it, it, it's a, it's a pun in French, but the French use the term formation to talk about professional training and education. So it's not you know, and a lot of that is not just you're not forming people, you're deforming people. You're you're limiting their perspective. You're you're depriving them of common sense. And if you're preparing people for a necessarily uncertain future, right? What, what's the one thing we know about the future? It's what we don't know. Yeah. We don't know, right? <laughs> right? We, the, the future is unpredictable. So knowing this, this definitive characteristic of the future, the future is unpredictable. How do we prepare people to deal with that? Particularly since we're, you know, we're, we're a world empire. And we can have a very good discussion about whether that, that, that that's a good thing or not. Whether we want to be to have that role, but as long as we have that role, we can be sent anywhere in the world. In the 1990s, we used to joke, you know, in, in the Marine Corps, we can be sent anywhere in the world except maybe Afghanistan. Yeah, <laughs> that was the, the one place. Is like, well, we're probably not Antarctica, uh, and probably not Afghanistan because it's so darn landlocked. You know, how do we how do we get there? Well, guess what? Where where have we been for the past seventeen years? Yeah. The again, we, we 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 couldn't we couldn't predict it. We couldn't predict it because these things are unpredictable. So if you can't predict the future, how do we prepare people for the future? Well, what's the answer to that? <laughs> well, the first thing is we don't give them this false model, whatever that model may be. That's that we don't pretend we can predict the future. So we don't publish these manuals that talk about ideal battles. We, we don't say we're going to do AIDA. We say we've got, we're going to practice lots of things. So again, we, we're this improvisational comedy troupe. Right. Well, if, you, if you like uh, Pierre Spray, the guy uh, who designed the A-10, among other things, uh, likes to use the example of, of, of a jazz group, right? You're always, you know, if you're a jazz musician, you're always riffing off the other musicians. Very similar. Uh, improvisational comedy is even, even more. You, you, you develop certain routines, some routines you like more than others. There are times when you deploy those routines immediately, really unchanged. And there are times when you modify those routines. Mm -hmm. But putting it all together, you're engaging, you're engaging with the audience. You're engaging, you know, a good comedian always knows how to handle hecklers. Sure. And hecklers are, are a benefit to the comedian. Uh, sometimes you go out to the audience and say, give me a word. Tell me, you know, and, you know, the, the audience says cheese. And you start developing this, this take, taking your, your, your pre-existing routine, which may have been about, you know, dogs or your mother-in-law. But now it's about cheese, and the the and they they, they keep keep again. I really recommend uh, anybody who's interested in, in in military education, you know, go look at some, go to your local comedy club, and find a really good improvisational troupe like the old Second City TV back when they were in Chicago and and going back to the sixties. Or, or, or watch some videos of a really of a comedian who can really engage with his audience, 
and really riff off of the audience. That's this capability that we want. So the question is, how do, how, how do we get that? How do we, how do we practice that? Yeah. How do we practice that in ways that, that, that give you all these other things you want from military education and training, which is the ability to talk to each other, the ability to cooperate yeah. with each other, an understanding of, of, of the technicalities. So you, you have to know how far your weapon can shoot, what its effects will be, its, its physical effects. Because of course, you also will have the, the psychological and tactical effects and the effects, the most important effect is the effect it has on what you're trying to do. So that, that's what I'm wrestling with. That's, that's, yeah. that, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm searching for. And the, um, uh, and the best thing I have found so far, it's not the only thing. There, there are lots of techniques out there. But the technique I like the best is this thing I call the decision forcing case. I, I actually borrowed that term from, from the Harvard Business School. Uh, and they use it for for something that's a little bit different that involves a lot more, usually a lot more in the way of, of formal analysis. There's usually a lot of numbers because, of course, they're in business and business is about money. So you have to do some calculations. I hear what you're saying and I understand it and and often do something similar to that, like in, in the lab, actually on the ground where you have infantry soldiers and it's. Here, here's what inevitably happens because I've gotten good at this, right? So I go and I work with the battalion. I go see the commander and, and I speak commander. So basically I say, here's my bona fides. I know how to do this. You're going to put me under a captain. I'll end up talking directly to you with open access to you whenever you want. It's going to take you three weeks to get what I do and three months to realize it's invaluable. And you'll look at me and you'll say, hey, Pete, you're the best person at this that I've ever seen. You're a huge force multiplier. And you don't have to say it because we've already had the conversation now. But all I'm asking for is a couple of rides here and there and, and, and some chow and a place to sleep. And the commander basically is like, yeah, if you're going to deliver all that, go ahead. And then three months later, you know what happens? I'm standing in front of the guy and he's like, holy shit, Pete. I, I can't believe all this. Because I give them the what's going on. That's what they lack desperately. And they have the ability to adapt what they lack is that external force, that external credible force. I can be honest to everybody out there. It might suck. I might be the bearer of bad news a lot. But if you take it in a different way, if you reorient that, you say, this is reality. Pete, Pete brings reality, and we have to adapt to this alternate reality because what I try to – Ultimately, what I'm trying to do, Bruce, is I'm trying to take what the Afghans are doing in, in this case and understand it enough that I can translate it into the staff room so they can stop making big assumptions because that's all they can do. They're not on the ground, right? And yes. once as an agent of that, I'll take an entire brigade and I will turn that big cruise ship towards a different direction. You know, by just talking to the commander and creating influence with them and saying, these things are unaccounted for. These are the results that you're getting. And they're like, stop everything, you know, full stop, turn the rudder. We're going left, not right anymore, you know. So it does seem like an external agent of some kind that can be honest, that understands the commander. You know, I, I can break down the commander's mission, you know, in three or four sentences. But that's a rare thing. It, it is a very rare thing, and I, it's a rare thing because I think so much of what we do in edu education and training is we're creating these these formal structures that that we tell people take the structure and superimpose it upon the reality, right? As opposed to asking the, the, the very basic question: first of all, what's the reality? With with the full realization that. You often don't know what's going on until you engage it. And here we go back to the bias for action. Yeah. That the, uh, there is a, a radical empiricism here. Every situation is unique. How do you find out about the unique situation? You've got to engage it. So you start off with, with one theory. A theory we, 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 in the case of it, it's called the theory of the case. Here's what we think is going on. Then you start doing things that engage it. As Napoleon would say, first I get involved and then I see. Je m'engage et puis on voit, right? Uh -huh. right? I, 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 I get myself involved and then I see. So there is a, a discovery process that's about action. 
But let me let me push back on this a, a little bit because this episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. But let me let me push back on this a, a little bit because if um, oh at the time General Mattis shows up, he can't see anything. It, it's impossible. He he's got too much influence. The second he steps into the ground, reality changes around him. He has to have oh, very much. Yes, yes. Oh yes, yes. Right, right. And and this is also why you either use the the the, the Boyd analogy of, of the boy the boy uh, vision of, of the oodle loop right uh you're you're just like you've got the two fighter pilots in the sky they're dog fighting whether it's over over france in 1916 or over korea in 1951 that they're everything you do changes that reality and that ability to 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 orient to, to figure out what's going on or for, to observe to, to 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 see things to take in information the faster you can do that, the greater the advantage you have, all other things being equal. And it's the same thing, same thing with, with, with the case method. You're always asking yourself, what's going on here? Yeah. Yes, I'm not, I'm not a distant observer. I'm part of the system. And every, everything I do, including a lot of things that may be a function of my, of my reputation, if, if I'm fighting against General Patton or Tiger Jack, you know, uh, Shirley Wood, uh, or commander like that, I'm going to be very different. But my environment's going to be very different it, than what it would be if I'm fighting Mark Clark. And and that happens even before he shows up on the battlefield. If I know that, that's that's going to change the reality. And if I'm I, I, if I'm fighting against you know uh, fighting against Jim Mattis, I I know a little bit about his reputation. I know a little bit about, about his personality. I know he's going to want to do some bold things. And maybe I want to set a trap that that exploits that. And the the uh, but it's all it's all it's highly individual. It's highly peculiar. It is it is a wicked problem, not yeah. in the New England sense of wicked, but <laughs> but in uh, right. you know or, or 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 the moral sense, but in the sense of a unique problem that requires a unique solution. It's all custom tailoring. And yes, there are patterns, but those are patterns of, of rhyme rather than repetition. So these patterns, as you try to, because, you know, humans like patterns, we get, we're all archetyped up on patterns, but we often get things wrong and we sort of, you know, we have a bias about our gut. You got to go with your gut. Well, how about all the times your gut was wrong? Account for those like, oh, well, my gut kind of sucks. I was <laughs> you know, like, it's, well, it's well, how, how do you get a better gut? How do you, how, how do you train your gut? Yeah. Fair question. You know, the, the, yeah, um, there's a psychologist uh, named Gary Klein. You may have heard of his his work. Um, his his latest book is very good. Shadows and spotlights, spotlights and shadows. I forget exactly what it is, but 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 Gary Klein and uh, Klein with a K, K L E I N Klein. Right. Superb psychologist. His work is all about is, is training the gut. It's the whole idea of how do you constantly compare your instincts right with your rational mind you're using your rational mind to figure out the world and that informs your instincts and you go through various exercises that you're constantly training your instinct to be better at again answering this question of what's of what's going on and if if you practice that then you develop a very a much better relationship between your your gut you know, your 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 visceral thoughts and the the, the rational self. Because if, if you talk to you know people who study the brain, rationality is this little little tiny takes up a tiny proportion of our of, of our brain power. Most of our brain is is devoted to things is to, to instinct and and to these semi conscious or even unconscious in, unconscious things. So how do you how do you build that relationship between the instinctual and the rational 
in ways that 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 enhance both. How do you develop a a cultivated instinct, a cultivated gut? And if you look at people who are who are very good at what they do, whether you know experienced firefighters or or jazz musicians, these are people who are constantly going back and forth between the rational mind and the gut. It's not that one's better than the other. One is much faster than the other. One is much better at figuring things out. So, so you, you, you want a system of training that cultivates both and cultivates both simultaneously. It's a challenge, boy. I mean, how do you take a 23 year old dude who's going to run an infantry platoon and, uh, and, and ask that much of him. You know, that's just a lot. Those guys have so much going on, especially if they're out in an outpost somewhere, you know, just far removed from any real help. I mean, I've been on these places where you can't bite off a fight because you can't support a fight. You're, you're there to be there and uh, don't take too many chances because there's literally no help coming, you know? Well, now, let's, let, 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 let's do some, some imagining here. Let's, okay. Let's... Let's go from from the, the what is to what might be. You think of that 23 year old young lieutenant. He's got four years of college. That's a long time. Uh, he's, he's gone through through uh, either you know ROTC or some sort of OCS. Right. He's gone to his, if he's in the army, he's gone through his basic course. In the Marine Corps, he's gone through the basic school plus his you know if the officer course or some equivalent course. So he's got a lot of formal training. Yep. There's a lot of, of, of time and money that's gone into preparing him for this moment. In, in, in fact, I mean, he's been in school since he was seven years old, six or seven years old. So what if the first day of college, he walks into the classroom and the professor says, ladies and gentlemen, you're Napoleon Bonaparte or <laughs> whoever. It is 1 January 1814. You've got three armies coming at Paris, which is where you are. One's commanded by a guy who used to work for you, yes. Bernadotte. <laughs> one is commanded by Schwarzenberg, who works for your father-in-law. And one is commanded by this crazy, half-drunk Prussian who Old. just hates you. Old and angry. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. What do you do? And we can give you some numbers. We give you a map and, and what have you. And imagine if you do that for every day of college, two or three times a day. And then you come to Fort Benning or, or, or Quantico. And people keep doing the same thing to you, similar things, except now you're, you're in the field, you've got a unit, and then we do, do, do a lot of free play. I'm a huge believer in, in, in free play. The, so you've got five years yeah. of that experience. That's sort of um, you know, very different from you know, what, what goes on in college these days, which is largely about, right, right, college is largely about arguments, right? You go into the lecture hall, there is somebody making an argument. This aspect of reality is like this. Take notes, copy down my argument, read the textbook, which is more arguments. And then either if it's a, if it's a really good course, we're going to ask you to write some papers or take an exam in which you make your own arguments. Unfortunately, in more, most courses, it's just give me my argument back to me. So rather than dealing with reality, you're learning how to deal with this, this superstructure, this, this, this construction. This, this argument, then you go to, again, Fort Benny or Quantico, and much of what you're taught, not entirely, because I, I, don't, I haven't been, been to Fort Benning lately, but right. I know some folks want to go do, doing, doing some good things there. But the, fundamentally, you get, you're getting more arguments. You're getting more lectures. You're reading more textbooks, and you're learning. You're, you're getting more of these, these structures. So... Um, Again, it's not that we lack the time to prepare people. We've got plenty of time. I think it's how we're doing it. Yeah, I think there's definitely, I mean, one of the things that we've learned through the work that I've done is, is our attention to detail is fantastic if you're talking about operating a tank and putting rounds on a target. If you take the disciplines required in modern combat to, to deal with the day-to-day -day tasks that advance the strategy, that there's actually a link from the actual ground truth all the way up to that theoretic outcome. Those are completely different tasks and they're not treated the same way if they're considered at all. I mean, it's, I, I'm not a big believer in language capacity. Like, sure, okay, great, you know, you can learn a couple languages and everything. But once we have a place picked 
and we're going to go there. If you don't have that capacity, it's far more advantageous to learn how to use a, an interpreter at an advanced level. Most of the training is captured in just the most basic ways. I mean, you know, a couple thousand words of, of text and then uh, essentially no training time other than just talking and using the person as a, as a mouthpiece. That's just not going to cut it with the fights that we've been fighting for the last 20 years. And all of the work we do in Africa primarily deals with dealing with interpreters. But we don't think of it that way. So we have these scenarios. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're a lieutenant with a heavy platoon in a valley, and you're not allowed to bite off too much because you don't get air assets on a day-to-day basis. Uh, you've got a populace that's terrified of what's next, and there's a huge specter of uncertainty and instability. You have a governor that, for all intents and purposes, is not present. Even if he was present, the government above him provides him with little, if any, resources to create a government thing. So you've got a, gov- a people separated from their government, an enemy that won't engage you directly. You're losing in an information campaign. Like All these things go against you right, really fast. That's what's going on. Now, how do you act audaciously in this? Because pushing forward with weapons out and engaging targets is not an option. It's not going to happen. Oh, no, no. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all. Right. And the only time you want to do that is if you're trying to convince the, the other party, who, again, may be an enemy, may be a friend, may be a, a frenemy. Yeah, a I, I love the term co-belligerent. You guys are all fighting, but not yes. necessarily each other. <laughs> yes, so, well, that's the other thing is, is that is war necessarily two sided? Right. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Uh, much of history is three, four sided uh, conflicts, which, which, in, and the, the logic is very different. But the, that's why I always say, you know, go back to a specific situation, something that actually happened as opposed to this theoretical model that is usually an attempt to distill a bit of history. The, we, we, we take a bit, a bit of history, we say, oh, well, we liked that particular bit of history. We liked World War II. And when we say we liked World War II, really what we liked was certain campaigns in World War II. So summer, of, you know, late summer of 1945, you're with General Patton, or again, uh, a guy I, I, I think we should all study, Shirley Wood, and you're, you're chasing, you're, you're zooming across France in your, your Sherman tank, you know, with the 4th Armored Division, you're having a grand time and the sun is shining, the birds are singing and the girls are pretty and we're fighting exactly the kind of war we want to fight. And then we say, OK, yes, yeah, so the future war is going to be like that. I say, no, well, probably not. It might be, but it may, may be a lot like, you know, the guerrilla war we fought in New Jersey in the Hudson Valley in 78. Yeah, uh, it, it, it may be more like like Vietnam and even you know, I mean, how many different wars that were there in Vietnam. Lots of different wars, you know, the the. And, and even if you want to say, well, OK, well, I'm going to be a Kleinista. I'm going to fight low intensity conflict. And all of a sudden, somebody, you know, the, the North Vietnamese attack your special forces camp with with, with tanks. Yeah. I mean, the little tanks, little <laughs> tanks. <right? laughs> the, the point is, is not that that one model of war is better than the other. The point is that there uh, there's every model is necessarily imperfect. So you want to give people this this habit of, 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 of being fluid with models and and, and custom tailoring a model that's as close to the reality as we can get, realizing that reality is always is always changing. Now, that said, uh, your point about interpreters is interesting, because what do we know about the world? We know people speak different languages. So, okay, so we, what does that mean? And yes, we're spoiled because English is now the international language for so many purposes. Right. Which means that a lot of people are going to know our language. We're not going to know their language. So there's there's a certain predictability here, which is, OK, wherever we go, we're going to deal with interpreters. So maybe that's the kind of, of basic skill we want to teach is how to deal with interpreters, because interpreters are very interesting. They have their own interests. Sometimes they're improving what we say. I've, I've not worked often with interpreters, but but I was in Georgia. I did a project in Georgia about 10 years ago. And I noticed that the, the interpreters were really improving on what the Americans were saying. They were correcting mistakes. They were eliminating profanity. They were, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> dealing, you know, reducing acronyms and jargon and doing all these, 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 these things. Now, that's a good interpreter. 
Right. Now, of course, you, your interpreter is not help, helpful. <laughs> the interpreter wants to, 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 to make life difficult for you. He can do that as well. He can do, 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 do the opposite. So I, I'm not saying there aren't, there, there isn't, there aren't predictable things. The other predict, the most predictable thing, of course, is, is mechanical. Um, you know, how to operate your tank, you know, how to put the shell in the breach. It only goes one way. Yep. Right. There, there's a right answer and there's a wrong answer. <laughs> and, and again, part of our difficulty is we're so used to methods for teaching mechanical skills that we say, well, let's take these same methods and, and apply them to human things, to these interpersonal, to these, these, these situational things, which have a very different logic. Uh, Martin Van Creveld, uh, who's I guess, I probably is he my, my most favorite military history, he's certainly up, up there, top five. Martin wrote a book some several years ago called Technology and War. And he, his argument is very similar to the one I, I'm, argument I'm making is, is essentially his, that there is a military logic and a technological logic, and they're different. And this is why I'm a big believer that if you're training naval officers or Navy officers, training people to serve at sea, you want to train them in sailing ships. Because if you train them in modern ships with, with great big steam-driven power plants, turbines and things like that, or nuclear, nuclear reactors, they will have a machine that stands between them and the sea. Huh. Whereas if you're in a sailing ship, you're dealing directly with the sea. Learn the sea first, then learn the machine. Because the sea is a lot, the sea is much more like warfare than, than a machine because of its unpredictability. Not as, it is not as unpredictable as warfare, but it's the same sort of, same sort of phenomenon. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. So the, we have to make a clear distinction between mechanical skills because the machine can only be addressed in one way. And I'm thinking in particular of, of, of old fashioned machines. And, and, and what's remarkable about the weapons we use, this may change sometime soon, but right now, we've, our weapons are remarkably old fashioned. You know, the, the, the rifles we use were invented in the 1950s. Yeah. Our machine guns also creatures of the 1950s. We're still using the, the, the 50 caliber machine gun, the Maud Deuce. Yeah. That's from the 1919s. Right. 1919, 1918, right, right. The, the, the requirement was written, I think, in 1917 or 1918, shoot down balloons, right? Yeah. Uh, dear Mr. Browning, can you help us shoot down balloons? Yep. You know, and it's going to be later. We actually, actually throw a party for, for Maud Deuce because she's 100 years old. This, yeah. You know, this, this. And, you know, I, I'm told the people who, who refurbish these things are, you know, are finding, you know, lower receivers from, from the 1920s. Not a surprise. Not, not a surprise, right? These, these are things that things were made when the Charleston was still cool. <laughs> right? A, I'm doing a the Charleston time. right now. With the Charleston right now, the the um, there we're, we're living in many respects in a very old-fashioned world. At least when it comes to a lot of mechanical things. Now, computers are different. Computers are you know because they're so complex or they're so complicated they become complex. And there there are several different ways to make a computer do it do what they're supposed to do. But that's a different story. But there's this sharp distinction I think we ought to make between mechanical skills. Right, thumb clip, pull pin. You got to do it in that order. If you don't do it in that order, you'll only do it once. Guarantee the that. Right. Yeah. Very unforgiving to again these human things, which are fluid, constantly changing, always, always different. And that, of course, is the much more demanding thing. You can you can practice the mechanical things. You can you can turn those into a drill, and probably ought to because you want these things to be instinctive when people are under extreme stress. But the the other bit. Uh, is requires a very different set of 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 attitudes and and skills and and knowledge. We're coming up on the end of our hour here, so I, and I, I really am going to run out of uh, uh, time with you. But I wanted to get some idea on how you think of the concept of affect over effect. You talked about coindonistas, and they're big on you know the hearts and minds. But the thing, the problem with that, and I've not heard a lot of studied thought on it, is that, yeah, that's great, hearts and minds. But really, what the Vietnamese, what the Iraqis, what the Afghans need, the, the leadership, the government needs the hearts and minds. So we're over here trying to build these towers and these things that make the Iraqis love us. And the reality is, is if we focused on not just creating capacity, the mechanical government that may or may not work well, but if we created the ability to create an affect where the people in the village respond to the stimuli of the government in a positive way, you got half a chance of building hearts and minds in the right direction. That's that's one of the problems with the whole counter counterinsurgency platform is that at its root we're, we're going after the wrong win. 
So in terms of affect over effect, if, if I can take your effect-based action and create my desired affect, I'm going to win. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whoop your ass with culture and, soci- and societal change every day of the week. And I think this also goes to your thing about technology versus military thinking. Military is about imposition of will. Technology is about filling the, the corners of, of a spider web w- with automation. And it just solves tiny little problems, but it never stops. It always goes. Like uh, we had a guy on one of my shows, and he said, "Would you bet against the software engineer over like over ten years, or would you bet with him?" Oh, come on! <laughs> like you got to bet with the shooter in that case because those guys are they're so brilliant. So you know, we are really close to run out of time. In like four minutes or so, can you talk about that basic topic? Very much so. So I, I think that. This dichotomy we have between low intensity and high intensity, uh, between small wars and big wars, I think that fundamentally that's a false dichotomy. It causes, gives us more trouble than benefit. Right. That the um, that these things blend into each other, and and I, I think when we talked about the in the old days about the spectrum of conflict, we were we were in much better shape than we are by by trying to create these these separate categories. I'm not saying there aren't differences. Right. But I think mean, there are lots of differences between different situations and that every situation will have elements of of both. That that every every military situation is in some respect a, a hybrid. And so it really isn't particularly helpful to say uh, to to really to create two different arts, particularly if you have organizations that think, oh, okay, I'd really rather be yeah, doing something. More than that, you see lots of wars which combine elements of both. In fact, most wars that I know combine elements of both. You, you occasionally will have a few very short wars in the in the in the 19th century where it was pure conventional. Uh, but even then, if you if, if you scratch it, uh, if you scratch those wars, I'm thinking of, of the German wars of of, of unification, uh, which in, in a sense we're still trying to copy. Yeah. Even they, if you look closely, you have lots of guerrilla warfare. So look, look, look at Napoleon, Mr. Conventional Warfare himself. Yes. Well, you got, where, where does the word guerrilla come from? It comes right. from this, this war in Spain, and he had a similar one in, in the Tyrol with, with, with Hoffer. And, and uh, so, so you scratch every conventional war, you'll find, you'll find a guerrilla war. And scratch every guerrilla war, you'll probably find some conventional. And the the... Uh, and that's why this people say, well, w- was Vietnam a, a conventional war or was, was it a guerrilla war? And the answer is yes. Yes. It was both. <laughs> was the American War of Independence a conventional war or a guerrilla war? It was both. Yeah. The, the, the irony here is that is that 18th century people were much better at this than we were. Right. You know, George Washington isn't thinking, oh, OK, well, is this a low intensity conflict or is this a, 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 a conventional war? No. So I need a continental army that's going to be well disciplined and well drilled thank you baron von steuben yeah uh, we're going to be as as uh, we're going to out red coat the red coats but at the same time i'm going to have all these characters out there in in the woods in in westchester county in new jersey and 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 south carolina and all those places i'm going to have daniel morgan doing his rifleman thing and 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 it, we're always going to be a little bit country a little bit rock and roll and not afraid to leave a fight that we can't win Oh yes, no, the, the 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 great strategist of the greatest strategist of the 20th century was Kenny Rogers, right? Uh huh. No one, no one to fold him. So what? that's that, that's what I, what I want to leave the audience with is some some musical wisdom. Yeah. First thing, what's going on? Uh huh. Always ask yourself Marvin Gaye's question. The second thing is, and this is from Donnie and Marie. Remember Donnie and Marie? Oh You're sure. Probably too young. For Donnie and Marie. Um, every conflict is a little bit country. A little bit rock and roll. Nice. And the final thing is again, the great strategist is Kenny Rogers. Got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. And don't count your money sitting at the table. There's plenty of time for counting when you get home. 
everybody. This is awesome. Bruce Goodmanson is... You guys got to go check out his stuff. You'll be lost for hours learning about all of these things. Uh, I really appreciate your time and coming on. Man, this is awesome. Let's let's do it again soon. Let's get you in with somebody else, and let's create a little positive tension and have some really challenging conversations. Getting getting you and Colonel Andy on the same show would just, that would be awesome. So, again, thank you so much for coming on. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. 